and next we are going to introduce Kimberly Tater. Hi there. Hello. Hello. It's Tater, right? Teeter. Teeter. Okay, I apologize. A little it's bit of an tighter. intro. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. A little bit of an intro for Kimberly. Um, Kimberly is the daughter of heavenly parents whose names are redacted. Um, she is a daughter of earthly parents, Hattie and Richie. She is the wife of Matt, the mother of Ava and Penelope, and a friend of all. She's a licensed psychologist in the state of Utah and assistant director of the Deborah Bonner Unity Gospel Choir. She has been enjoying watching her plants grow during the, academic, during the pandemic. So, pandemic, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Well, welcome to our Facebook Live this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to start our interview just by asking a couple of questions, um, and then we'll open it up to our Facebook Live um, feed and kind of get some questions happening there. The first thing that we have is um, the question about faith and faith journeys. When you, did you ever arrive at a fork in the road in your faith where one choice would lead you away from the restored gospel and the other choice would lead you toward the restored gospel? What was that fork in the road and how did you navigate making that choice? Um, so I think when I was thinking about this question, I thought about um, kind of all of the different identities that I have um, that have led me to have the experiences that I've had. And so in some ways, it's hard for me um, to not to have come to one of these crossroads or um, the thing I thought of was there's a scene from the TV show, The Office, uh, where Jim and Pam, who uh, were like the will they or won't they couple in the beginning and then they're like a faithful couple in the middle and then they start to have problems at the end um, they start to go to couples therapy after a, a kind of a tense point in their marriage and um, you know Pam says I'm supposed to be practicing speaking my truth because if I had spoken my truth before we wouldn't have had this opportunity to have a couples therapy and Jim's is like oh by the way we're supposed to use opportunities for things that we don't like and so I have had many opportunities I guess um oh <laughs> to do cross, uh, crossroads of faith um and I, I approach things pretty intersectionally, typically, so like it's hard for me to separate one of my identities from another, but I, I've written some stuff down and I've tried to do it. Um, so I grew up in North Carolina um, and growing up as a Latter-day Saint in North Carolina is interesting. Um, people not familiar with the South will sometimes say North Carolina is not the South. Um, and it is not true. So um, as early as elementary school, I would have kids come up to me and say, uh, you know, like, you're going to hell. You got to just read the Bible. Um, I was vaguely aware of, um, you know, the churches in the area, like having classes for the youth to talk about how to talk to Mormons about how their faith wasn't right. Um, and I feel like when I was young, I kind of liked having the identity of being different. Um, but it was challenging where I would see people that seem like good people to me and like in some ways especially when it came to the bible had um more scriptural knowledge than i had but then um i was supposed to be the one with the truth uh quote unquote um but i would still kind of hold this mormon identity um pretty up high i think um and then when i got to college um the Latter-day Saint Student Association would try to do events with the Christian groups on campus and people didn't want to do stuff with us and so I thought I was like a pioneer like I was going to go in and tell them like what we knew and all this stuff um and then I didn't understand why that wasn't taken well um but um at some point I think my senior year one of the girls said to me um you know, you're the one who says that you have the truth um, and you're saying that we don't have things to offer. Um, and so that really stuck with me because it didn't feel fair and it didn't feel like that's what the God I knew would want. Um, and so then it really made it hard for me um, to 
um, really wholly embrace truth claims um, that the church would offer because of knowing how it pained other people who I saw as good people. And I didn't like um, who I was to have like pride in relating to those people. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I think another thing relates to uh, me having a desire for LGBTQ advocacy. Like from the time I was 13, I, you know, I read about Harvey Milk High School, which is a LGBT high school in New York City. And I'm like, that makes sense. Um, and so LGBTQ advocacy was a, a big part of my life. Um, and so, you know, 2015 was a trying time for me in a lot of ways. Um, for one, the the issue of the um, handbook and the, and the policy um, was one issue, but then, um, you know, there were people at the time that left the church saying, like, this is the worst thing that has ever happened um, in the history of the church. And so as a Black woman, it's really hard for me to abide when people say things like that. Not that it's an oppression Olympics, but it, it felt uh, invalidating to my experience to, to depict it that way. Um, and so that was another thing that I had trouble with. And then I think when I think about my experiences as a black woman um, in the church, um, there's so much of my culture of origin, I guess, that I have relinquished willingly um, to have church membership. And so then it's difficult sometimes uh, to not have that sacrifice be respected. Um, and in lots of ways. So like when I was a teenager, um, kids didn't want to dance with me at church dances because of things that they didn't even know that they were getting through the air conditioning vent about interracial marriages and relationships. Um, when I, um, when I was 13, I guess a lot happened when I was 13 now that I think of it. Um, my grandma took the discussions and, um, I, to my recollection, like things were going along great. Um, and then um, my dad told her that at one point, um, black people couldn't hold the priesthood. And my grandma was like, well, that's it. That's it for me. Um, and it was the whole thing was shocking to me because I love my grandma and I respected her just sort of like I was saying with the other people that I grew up with. And it was the first time that I had heard it um, about black people not having the priesthood. And I, I kind of felt deceived by people that I had trusted to tell me things, uh, to be honest with me. Um, and so it continues to be difficult. One of the things that I uh, have done since moving to Utah, just kind of inadvertently, um, my family will occasionally attend special events at the Black Baptist Church down the road. Um, and it, there was a while there where we were probably going like every month or every couple of weeks. Um, and it's reminded me of this tradition of, um, in the black gospel tradition, there's this idea of claiming your blessing. So it's kind of like you, um, you move in your life as though, um, the thing that you want has already happened. Um, and so it's not, you know, if you take claiming blessings to the extreme, it's like, I claim the blessing of a million dollars, I'm going to live as though I have a million dollars, where maybe that's not the most effective thing. Um, but it, claiming the blessing of my place in this church allows me to see where I belong in a way that I don't when I'm looking for where I fit. Um, and so instead of assuming that my experiences are contrary and I need to change them to fit in with everybody else, I assume that like, because I have claimed this place in the gospel and my place in the restoration, I assume that those things fit somewhere and they're not going to fit everywhere, but I will like try it here. And so if it doesn't fit here, then I say, okay, well, it doesn't fit here. So I'll try it here. If it fits here, then great. Um, and so I've really been grateful almost for this uh, prompting I've had to 
uh, get in touch with those parts of my heritage because they're they're sacred to me and they're part of how God made me. They're a part of how God wants me to to see His face. Um, and so that is what I have done, especially in my adult years when I come to these crossroads. And it helps me to kind of radically accept the tension that comes when everybody else doesn't get it or when the road kind of winds in places that I don't really understand. So yeah. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing all of that, truly. Um, while you were telling that last story about claiming your blessings in the gospel, that reminds me of one of the stories with um, a bishop in early church history. Uh, I think his, his, I don't remember his last name, um, but uh, he got into a big argument with Brigham Young because Brigham Young was an incredibly challenging person to interact with. Um, and he, Brigham Young says, well, I, okay, now you're mad. You're going to go and apostatize, right? Because you have had this horrible experience. And he said, no, this is my church too. And more so, this is Jesus Christ's church. So if this is the fact, then I need to, to continue to participate. And that story for me is empowering also. And I love the way that you have taken back the power in your membership and in your way of worship. And I love that you're incorporating your roots into your, your worship practices because that's an amazing thing too often i think lds people are afraid of other religions or afraid of incorporating things that are a part of them and and that as you've just demonstrated can be a really huge blessing so we should feel encouraged to do that so thank you thank you for sharing all of that i feel so inspired and excited um, just hearing that <laughs> Now, the second question we have, I think is, I'm really interested in your perspective, especially coming from being a psychologist, um, where we're talking about mis mixed faith relationships um, with, with believing members and either members of our faith and another faith or people who have spouses or children or siblings that leave the church. Um, how can we create harmony in those relationships? How can we strengthen those relationships even? Um. So I do a particular type of therapy called dialectical behavior therapy, and it was designed for people who have a lot of difficulty in their lives, so much so that like their challenges quickly become overwhelming um, if they don't have very concrete pieces to put into place. Um, and they're almost like fake it till you make it skills. Like if you wash, rinse, repeat them enough times, you'll start to see the evidence that they work. I, you know, that kind of sounds familiar. I guess I'll choose the <laughs> circumscribed or whatever. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, so I was thinking about this question um, in terms of some of those skills. Um, and, and one of them, I think, uh, relates to the skill called checking the facts, where it seems simple, but um, a lot of times we think that we're reacting to what is happening when we're actually reacting to the emotional experience or reacting to our expectations of what we thought was going to happen, um, or we're reacting to some, like, you know, unperceivable or undescribable, indescribable threat that we see in the future. Um, and that's the space that we react from when we're in crisis. And so I think when we are contemplating like mixed faith relationships, I think we've all heard things about like, you know, you don't want to be the woman alone in the pews with your children. Like who will bless my baby? I mean, not to make light of these experiences because they are painful. Um, and I think that like, faithful people tend to make assumptions about what it means when people decide to leave a faith community. I think what um, the Uplift community and others have shown is that when people decide to leave a faith tradition, there is a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of thought. Um, and we don't necessarily have to perceive, I think the threat usually is that our family members are rejecting us when they decide to leave the church, or even that they're rejecting the church uh, when they leave. Um, I think Ben said something earlier that, it's something to the effect of like, um, you know, when people don't believe, it's not necessarily, I'm putting it into my words, what he said or how I interpreted it. So even I'm doing it, that like, when when people are have never been a member of our faith then we don't tend to think of it as an emotionally laden thing like it's more innocuous when people aren't um 
apart. They can look at things with like a beginner's mind or with a curiosity um, that sometimes it's hard for us to do when we're like in the thick of our emotions. And so um, at first I would say like when you feel those bits of tension, just ask yourself, what is the threat here? What do I think will happen if this road plays out? And then you can see if that is true or not true. Um, you can approach family members with curiosity instead of with the assumption or the expectation. And then you see what comes up naturally as opposed to um, what you think will happen in your head because the funny thing happens when you act on the reality that's in your head it ends up playing out sometimes and it could be uh, more destructive than we want it to be um, and then I think the other thing that's been helpful for me uh, when I used to do a lot of work with teenagers is this idea of validation and how I think of it with teenagers, especially because they can be difficult to understand. Like there is always some universe that you can understand stuff um, like and it can be really challenging with teenagers, I think, to get to the universe where things make sense. But once you get there, you're able to navigate out or like for the, the hikers or outdoor people in the room, which I am not one of these, but like if if somebody were out on a mountain or whatever and told you that they were lost, you can't just start telling them which direction to go unless you know where they're at. And so you you listen to where they are and then you can help them out if you need to, or at least assess the threat appropriately. Um, so that's kind of how I, I, I think of that. That's excellent advice, truly. I, I read something a while ago talking about, I believe the same type of therapy that you practice. Um, and the quote said something like, when you are, confronted with with really challenging or intense emotions remember that the feeling is probably real but it might not might not be true so when you're thinking about this like oh my goodness um for example my child just left the church there's going to be in our cute little celestial cottage there's going to be one less room with my son and daughter-in-law and all this stuff and it's so sad and i'm going to be so sad in heaven and it's going to be the just the worst um and what did i do as a person and a mother but but that's not true right it's it's a real feeling it's a real fear but that's not true and that's right. the hope of the gospel is is different so or you can use that fear more effectively. So like one thing that I often tell families, especially uh, that are working with kids is like, well, if you want an eternal family, your eternal family starts today. <laughs> like mm -hmm. if you want to alienate your child into oblivion so that they don't want to be a part of your eternal family, are you really getting what you want here? Or do you want mm -hmm. to treat them with the respect that they deserve and kind of hope it works out on the back end? So exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly. Thank you. Now we have an, a question from our Facebook Live um, that says, since almost all of our artwork and God, our artwork of God in Christ depict them as white men, I have greatly struggled to pray because I automatically imagine God as white. This is extremely painful for me because all of my life I've had experiences with racism and colorism. How have you constructed an image of who God is to you? And how have you come to be able to pray to God despite the imagery out there? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, Cause I'm, I'm old enough that like the vast majority of church printed materials was like all white people. Now it's different. Like, you have yeah. your African families or whatever, but like when I was growing up, it was just all white people. And I didn't really realize that it was hard for me to see myself in that until I was a lot older. And then I felt like it was challenging to um, like come to terms with. Um, last year, uh, I think you all had as a guest, Deborah and Harry Bonner. Um, mm -hmm. And we were talking about, um, this is a meandering answer to the question. Um, so two years ago, right, um, when the NAACP came to visit Utah, there was that like fake apology letter or whatever. Yes. Like, when I was mm -hmm. apologizing for the past racism of the church and like it was a 15 minute like, yay, no. It was like very uh, 
difficult. That same week, our choir had a performance uh, with the NAACP in the first presidency. And then after that, um, our choir was kind of debriefing afterwards. And this is a pretty common thing um, for our choir to do. Um, but I almost hesitate to talk about it now because it was it was almost like a sacred experience because people were being so honest about like just the pain that they have experienced as being black people in the church and but also the joy of it. Um, and one thing Deborah said, um, you know, they I forget when they joined the church, but she said, I always taught my children who they were and I always taught my children who God was. Um, when you hear her talk about how Jesus is your her friend, like her best friend, it, it seems like she doesn't even have to know what Jesus looks like to know that he's uh, her best friend. I don't know who's watched Love is Blind <laughs> on Netflix. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't have this. <laughs> no, but go for it. We already it started. Is, <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting how people can form this connection with somebody regardless of, of what they see because they're going on how they feel like how have they revealed themselves and and that can be more genuine than like the things that we assume about uh looking at a person at their face um and so i think from that time on two years ago i have really started to think about like well who am i and who is god to me um to the point where like when i pray i don't even like visualize their their faces i i visualize like energy or something i don't know just just things that are meaningful um and i look for god and and people who i trust are following him people like the bonners and people i you know my husband um just people that i trust and so like when i look for the god in people then it, it almost becomes impossible for for god to look like any think or for me to attach it to one like particular images not not that I pray to those people but I'm I I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I listen for my heavenly parents more than I look for them now whereas when I was younger it was probably different where I look to a certain image of people and and have that be what I trust instead I go on the the feelings of the divine that i have because i know that that comes from god and use that as the means to find him that's really wonderful i've i've had recent recently some similar feelings i think where um i started to realize that that i didn't need to think of jesus christ with a beard or heavenly mother with long brown hair i i don't know you know the the traditional things that i used to envision when i was younger because of what you're saying it's it's this overpowering feeling. It's a spirit. And I don't doubt that one day when I see God, when I see Christ, I'll recognize the face. But until then, right now, it's, it's something intangible. And so it's okay for it to be intangible. That's wonderful. And thank you for sharing that again. Hmm. Uh, we have one final question for you, um, again, from our Facebook feed. And it says, as a psychologist, what advice can you give for people who learn about the power of their own confirmation bias and how they how to trust their own to intuition in light of realizing their own psychology. Um, so intuition bias for those who are unfamiliar is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's just, you go into something thinking it's true. And so you pray about it and you're like, Oh yeah, I know that this is true. And so you confirm because of the bias that you already had and that you brought to the table. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, I'm sorry. This is like how therapy goes with you too. Like everything has a story. So yeah. <laughs> one time I was in, maybe this is not like good practice, but one time I was in uh, Target, I lived in New York. So like I say that because there are a lot of crazy people in New York and yep. like this is just an everyday occurrence. And so I was in Target and this lady uh, approaches me in the the aisles like she knew me she's like oh my goodness how are you doing how is your baby like all this stuff and i just you know i treated her how i treat every crazy person in new york like fine fine like it's good thank you for asking and then like i try to go away and then later i had the thought like if i were in utah this I would think that this was like one of my ancestors or whatever, like having a heavenly appearance in the aisles of Target. Um, and then I was like, well, what would be so wrong with um, interpreting it that way um, if it were an uplifting thing? Um, and so I think about that 
when you're asking about confirmation bias, there's some things where um, if, if it leads us to be functional, if it helps us to feel good, um, if it fits with the other things in our life, to a certain degree, I think it's okay that you go on that sense of confirmation bias, like you're expecting something to work, almost like the placebo effect, you're expecting something to work and so it works. Um, I do think if you want to get to the bottom of like where is truth on a deeper level, um, what has helped me kind of see what is, is using different mindfulness principles of observation. Um, like um, I have the, the Book of Mormon for the Least of These Reader um, by Fatima Soleil. Yeah, yeah. From the and she's amazing. And uh, BCC. BCC. Yeah, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Yes. No, <laughs> common <fine>. consent. <laughs> yeah. um, and she she is so skilled at saying, like, make sure you're looking. And, and you know, Vince Backman is like this too, and the Givens are like this as well. Like, make sure you're attending to who is speaking, and that informs their experiences. Um, that's what helps me to uh, separate, like, difficult doctrinal things um sometimes too i just look at like well who is the message or who is the messenger um what things might they be experiencing that influence how they share a certain thing of course nephi is gonna say his brothers are bad because he wants to be the good guy and that's okay like uh -huh. and so then i read those words with that lens um and so I, I start being more observational when I really want to test things out and see where the evidence lies. But in terms of just trusting that something will feel good because I want it to feel good, like I am actually okay with that. Maybe that is a dissatisfying answer. Um, uh -huh. I, I think maybe you have to be, it, it's helpful to be aware that that is what you're doing so that it's not like so jarring, but I am actually okay with people doing what is functional. Um, for them yeah yeah and that's that's a really important concept too is because to promote healthy living to pronounce being whole as a person you have to allow people to be the space of who they are and with our theology if we believe that everyone is meant to be unique and everyone is meant to have a different perspective and that's the kingdom of god then we have to allow for that as well and with confirmation bias i think sometimes in my experience, sometimes confirmation bias has kind of held me on the way. And then all of a sudden, divine intervention. And it's not happened a lot in my life. And I haven't been alive very long. Um, I'm in my mid 20s. I'm not that old. <laughs> but <laughs> there have been a few moments in my life where I've had that divine intervention. And I think actually, um, at one point in my life, I became really enamored with Darius Gray and his story. Yeah. As I became friends with Margaret Young, and kind of saw some of the things from her perspective working with him. And Darius Gray was uh, one of the three men that the, the 12 apostles met with. Um, he was one of the people that started the Genesis group, I believe. Yeah. And a real big pioneer for the African American members and just blacks in the church in general. And he talks about making the decision not to join the church and then having divine intervention and then having other experiences in his life where he's just going along and experiencing things and doing what he felt was right. And it was right too, but he also was accompanied by those moments of sacred divine intervention. And so I don't think that just by saying, Hey, conversation or come for confirmation bias is a thing negates the fact that God is going to step in every now and again and say, Hey, this is right. This is right. true. It's, it's like that scripture in Isaiah that, uh, this has been a really impactful scripture with me where he said, okay, just keep going. Just keep doing what you think is right. And eventually the spirit will come and tell you, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Yeah. All right. No, it's okay. Yeah. I had yeah. another experience. I know like my time is up, but, um, you know, I had like a similar um, experience. So I was in the B1 choir um, the choir that was in the event to commemorate the 40th anniversary. Wow, it's so long. The lift of the band and the priest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, moving to Utah was like very fraught for our family. Um, and I, you know, for so long, I was like, what are we even doing here? And I felt like pretty abandoned. Um, and, and then I joined like, the choir that I'm in now and then that basically led me to have the opportunity to be in this choir and so the first 
uh, rehearsal that we had, Gladys Knight says to us, everybody who is here today was picked by God to be in this choir. And I'm like, well, shoot, if this is what it took for me to get picked in this choir. Like all of the drama and all of the heartache and all of the loneliness and like just wanting things to be different, like have a, a different life. Like if it can lead me to be in the places where he wants me to be, like I can be okay with that. I can be humbled by that. So yeah. Thank you for thank sharing. You. No, thank you so much. That was, this is an exciting interview. Everybody to this point has just been so wonderful and we appreciate your thoughts and experiences. So thank you again for coming, Kimberly. I really appreciate everything that you said today.